De Bruyne for very, very interesting and insightful presentation. I myself have no expertise in this particular area, but I learned a great deal <coughs> by listening to you this morning. Uh, at the beginning, I just said that uh, we are uh, familiar with the, the terminology, but without fully <coughs> understand, just understanding what this terminology really uh, mean, and uh, uh, what are the merits and demerits of uh, these <coughs> instruments from both corporations' perspective and the public policy perspective. And then Bruner <coughs> uh, eloquently uh, summarized all uh, these uh, questions that we have. Now, with this, uh, uh, I'm sure the many of you would like to have this rare opportunity to make comments and questions regarding the Bruner's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we already have a number of sheets here. While I, I read this, if there are any other questions I uh, I can see some of the experts in this uh, related area. Uh, and the so if you have any questions, comments, please do so. Um, I guess that study for. I guess that study for a success of uh, M&A deals um, covered all transactions. Was there any specific study that looked at cross-border transactions in particular? Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. There uh, are numerous studies that look at cross-border mergers and acquisitions. And what we find is that uh, the, <clears throat> the premiums paid for target companies is actually even higher when the buyer comes from a different country. Um, and we find that the uh, propensity to lose money is even higher when you are the buyer entering a foreign country. Except, it's either the, all, all M&A is local, so there, there are always these exceptions. But uh, the exception is <clears throat> that companies who enter, who cross borders, consistently make money when they bring strength in the form of uh, new technology, Technology transfer, it should be no surprise to you, technology transfer is one of the consistently reliable ways to make money through cross-border M&A. Uh, and second, <clears throat> through um, the transfer of know-how. So technology refers to patents and, and uh, engineering techniques, but know-how could be many things. It could be uh, Walmart. Uh, extending its expertise on inventory management. It could be um, um, a company that's very good at, at brand management, extending its expertise to a, to a foreign area. So this, this gets back to one of the points I was making in my talk, that if you as a buyer are bringing strength to a cross-border deal, uh, the, the odds favor that the deal will go very well for you. But if you're doing it just um, out of weakness because you, you've run out of places to invest locally in your home country or even worse, if you're doing it out of sheer opportunism, then, then the odds are quite likely that you will destroy them. <coughs> Number of uh, question sheets, uh, some, <coughs> and actually some of the questions, of course, here are you already answered uh, during your presentation. But uh, let, let me pose uh, the couple of questions. Uh, uh, some of here. One is again, uh, you already touched on, but uh, uh, you would like to know <coughs> uh, how do you the uh, the uh, calculate the value of target companies. What are the main factors and how you calculate them? Actually, you said this all uh, cases are local, so that explains a lot, but uh, is, is there any general uh, any, uh, 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 factors you can, you can, you can mention? 
I, I love this question. This, this is a question of how, how do you value competence? And it is a, a, a question of universal significance in business and finance. Um, we, we should want to know the answer to this question, not merely to make better mergers, but to make better investments generally, and frankly, to manage our companies better. Because if we can value our company under different strategic scenarios, we can decide which strategy is the highest valued strategy. But so it all begins with understanding how to value companies. <clears throat> now, that was the easy part of the, the answer. The hard part is that there are um, <coughs> numerous ways to value companies. Uh, they all have strengths and weaknesses. In my book, Applied Mergers and Acquisitions, I describe them all. There are, I, at least I describe nine different approaches. And my, uh, my recommendation is to use as many of them as you can. Each approach conveys some special information. <clears throat> and then I suggest that from all of those different valuations, that you triangulate. Triangle. You, you, you triangulate in to an estimate of what you think the target company is worth. To triangulate is a word in English drawn from surveying. You know, when you survey land, uh, you, you identify the boundaries of the land. You can use, uh, and, and surveyors use the, uh, the principle of geometry that says if you know the length of one side of a triangle and two angles, you can describe everything about the triangle. So surveyors do what they do using triangulation. My argument is, in finance and business, we should use triangulation as well. We should use many points of observation. And, and, and then we have to decide. Uh, the, the method I like best is a method that uh, I see used in the best practice companies around the world. It's called discounted cash flow. And it simply forecasts the cash flows that you expect the target company to generate. And then you discount them back to the present using a rate of discount consistent with the risk of those cash flows. I could go on and on. I think yeah. I will pause there. Yeah. OK. Another question here is, again, you touched on uh, indirectly, but uh, you would like to know uh, what would be the most effective and efficient consolidation management after merger and acquisition. As you said, it's a local, so I suppose it depends on which company you're uh, dealing with. But uh, uh, any, any general recommendations you can, can make on, on this question? And this is one. The other one is actually a recommendation to you. Since you have so many case studies uh, already, and his uh, <clears throat> Citing to one good uh, M and A and the other and the bad M and A in his view, one good M and A case is the uh, German bus and the new one uh, Korean new one case. You consider is a good case, and uh, you might consider it in your case studies. And the other one is uh, quite controversial, Lone Star case of the the uh, Korea for exchange bank. Uh, uh, this you consider this a bad case. Uh, uh, he's recommending these two cases to consider in the case sites. Have you heard about these <laughs> cases? Yes, I'm, 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 I, I, I can't write books fast enough. There are more bad deals <laughs> than, than I can write books uh, in, in, uh, at any time. But, so the, the first point you raised uh, just now was? Was the, the uh, what would be the, the best Consolidation oh. method after uh, merger. This is uh, actually a uh, profoundly important point. You, you should all know that uh, simply negotiating a good deal is only the start of the, the beginning of the challenge. A uh, an area of M and A concerns itself with the integration of the two companies after the deal is done. You can have a great deal, meaning a deal struck at a very advantageous price to you, but the deal can still fail. 
if the two companies fail to integrate effectively. Um, I have studied some of the best practice corporations, and I'll give you just a few points uh, of what, we've, what we know from them, but it is a field that is still uh, evolving. Um, as you might guess, first and foremost, companies that enter the, the do M&A transactions often tend to be very, very good at integrating target companies. Companies that do transactions very infrequently uh, tend to have serious problems integrating companies. So in integration becomes a strategic competence, a skill that you should try to develop within your company. And of course, practice makes perfect. The more often you acquire companies, the more likely you are to develop the skills that make uh, integration successful. We know uh, that uh, what, what causes integrations to fail, among other things, are fears among the employees. Fears about, will they still have a job? Will they, who will they report to? Um, uh, will they have to move? Uh, what, what, what will change in their lives? And so the best advice begins always with try to uh, complete the integration as fast as possible. Because it is this uncertainty during the period of the integration that poses the greatest danger to your companies. For instance, uh, your most talented employees may feel um, uh, unrespected, they may feel underappreciated, they may feel at risk for their jobs. And so the most talented people leave first in an integration. You need to move very quickly to retain your most talented people. Um, similar, customers. In, in the integrations, you find uh, a great deal of confusion inside the combining companies. And this, this confusion tends to interfere with uh, a very high level of customer service. Customers start to feel that they're being neglected, that the company really isn't looking after their interests. And then the customers defect. And just like the employees, it's always the best customers who defect first. We could go on and talk about, about suppliers. We could talk about uh, union relations. We could talk about uh, R&D programs, research and development programs, in, in, innovation efforts. But when, if you pause for a moment, you, you will see that during this period of integration, the company is at great risk in uh, so many ways. So do it fast is the first and best advice we can offer. Let me, let me ask you this question. Uh, in, your, in, in, in your studies, did you find any differences in terms of successes or failures uh, the, between financial firms and the manufacturing firms? Since we have seen so many banks uh, having mega mergers all over the world, and the, not only banks but the financial institutions, and at, at, at the same time we see many M&As in, 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 in manufacturing uh, sectors as well. You said related uh, the uh, 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 M&As uh, have higher probability of su success. And so that already suggests that the financial institutions have uh, uh, that advantage. But do you see any differences in terms of uh, probability of success or failure? Uh, the probability of success is higher in, in the banking and finance. The reason is that uh, these are industries with barriers to entry so that, and they're protected uh, by regulatory agencies. Uh, as a result, the companies tend to be healthy. Um, and uh, we know that there are enormous economies of scale in certain operational aspects of financial institutions. So these mergers exploit the economies. Generally speaking, bank mergers pay, and they pay better than mergers in manufacturing. 
The, um, uh, the truth of this is that in virtually all countries around the world, um, restriction into the banking sector has been so high that uh, it, um, it has uh, created a condition, uh, a very favorable condition for um, economic results in bank mergers. If, if entry into the financial sector were as easy as is entry into manufacturing sectors, I think you would see the success rate of bank mergers and acquisitions uh, much lower than it is. I don't want to say that banking is uh, has a zero risk uh, to, to bank mergers, but it is, uh, I believe, lower risk than manufacturing mergers. Another question is regarding this uh, golden shares and the poison pill uh, idea. Uh, you did mention that the poison pill was uh, introduced by the during this uh, Margaret Thatcher era in the UK. Now, the golden shares. What I would like to know is uh, the. Uh, which states in the United States are allowed these golden shares uh, the, uh, issue? And uh, uh, since, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a discussion in Korea uh, introducing these uh, this, uh, instruments, and I understand the, uh, uh, some segment of the Korean government is against this idea because of, uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, efficiency uh, in your perspective. And uh, what are the general practices in the United States? The, um, to my knowledge, there is no um, uh, golden share at work in the United States. The, the government has privatized some operations but has not retained a golden share in any company in the United States. It may, it may exist, but I'm pretty close to the, the evidence, and I don't, I can't recall one case of a golden share being retained by the United States government. Now, the poison pill is permitted throughout the United States, <clears throat> and um, um, the, the courts uh, have. Uh, <laughs> There's no legislation that permits the poison pill. It is in the United States. We have a common law system, and uh, if, if you if you have an idea like a poison pill, you, you try it, and if the courts approve, then it, then it gains the force of law. But um, the courts have been very friendly to poison pills, much to my surprise and the surprise of many economists. Um, the um, the, the reality is that we have a very uh, vigorous um, climate of shareholder activism presently in the United States. And uh, these active shareholders, many of them are very sophisticated, many of them represent large institutional investors, some of them represent hedge funds and, and uh, very wealthy individuals, uh, and they are fighting battles company by company by company to get the companies to withdraw their poison pills. And we have seen some notable examples this year of uh, companies that withdrew poison pills. But it's a very slow process. Uh, I think the poison pill is here, here to stay and um, um, we, we, we must live with it. Okay. Any, any other any other questions or comments? Yes. So the question I have uh, related first my question, my C Palm of Rice Incorporation. The question I have is related to a uh, trend we've been seeing in MA of market for the past few years, particularly regarding to a uh, merging of uh, media companies, so that's internet companies merging with um, TV companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Ava Time Warner, QAP uh, or so it's another name that comes to my mind. Recently, there's news about PCCW Hong Kong, uh, which failed in its attempt to create a what's called digital convergence company. And also, yesterday, I read a read a news article that uh, entity Docomo is acquiring a uh, share in uh, Nippon TV. Um, they can try to create a similar 
quote unquote digital communist model. Similarly, even as in you know, in Korea, uh, telecommunication companies have has been acquiring um, what's what they call content providers, um, say the music companies, uh, the movie producers, or that. Um, so it seems that past records show that though such a uh, merger between unrelated companies has been rather unsuccessful, yet yet these companies uh, try to attempt the uh, same as over and over again. I don't know if you have any kind of studies. I've never seen any. So of these orders actually produce the synergy they claim to produce. In another word, has there been any successful attempts between this, uh, these components models? And um, if not, why why uh, why are these companies doing it? And what's the rationale behind it? And most importantly, uh, do you think it's a good idea? Uh, you, you picked a great industry, uh, an excellent example of, for us to discuss the strategies for M&A. Um, my view is that the, the acquisition, the, the merger between a content producer and a uh, distributor like an internet company or a cable TV company, this is a, what we call a vertical combination. Horizontal combinations are mergers between peers in an industry, two coal companies or two shipping companies or two steel companies. A vert and, and all of the research shows that the most money to be made in mergers and acquisitions is uh, in horizontal transactions. The next most money to be made is in vertical transactions, and the least money to be made is in unrelated, or as we say, conglomerate, conglomerate transactions. Um, so the question is, uh, in some cases, these vertical transactions succeed. In some cases, they don't. Why have they not worked out very well? in uh, media. And, and your, your point is exactly correct, that uh, the, uh, the failure rate is really very high. I think investors, uh, would, uh, looking back over the past 10 years, would have to express great disappointment at what's happened. The theory was that there would be a convergence between content and channels. There would be a convergence between many different media, internet and, and uh, cable being a, a prime example, and that therefore, by, by creating these large combinations, you would exploit the uh, synergies, economies of various kinds. And uh, uh, what happened was that the, um, the synergies never emerged. Uh, the internet space has yet to prove the um, attractiveness of the model, uh, that, that you can actually make money by selling advertisements on, on websites, for instance. A few companies are making money at it, but by and large, it's still a very, very young field. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's too early. And if you, if you think about it, there are almost no barriers to entry in uh, the internet space. We know that we know that very high rates of return come from market positions that exist because of barriers to entry. And if there are no barriers, then where is the money to be made in the internet space? Um, truly, I believe that the uh, the um, significant money is made first in the generation of content. Uh, and second, in the distribution of that content in very uh, restrictive ways. So I think that, in theory, uh, a cable company combining with a content producer could uh, succeed if the cable company owns, has access to a, uh, a portion of the viewing public uh, and, and, in effect, owns that, that public, then uh, I, I would still be optimistic that there are some attractive returns to be made, but the, the the issue is not that the cable company owns those companies, it's that the cable company is competing with the internet and with satellite TV and with free broadcast television and, and the like. It's, um, we have seen such a rapid rate of technological development and deregulation in media that it'll be years before we can determine for sure who owns the relationship with any particular customer. And for those reasons, um, 
the marriage between content and uh, distribu distribution has not worked. I think it's more, in conclusion, I think those failures are more a result of bad timing than they are of bad strategic concept. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I think uh, we have to end at uh, this point. Actually, the, uh, I will just quote you the, the, <coughs> the Asian Wall Street Journal article appeared on Wednesday, uh, June 28th. It says, 2006 is an is on pace to be the most active merger year in history. As measured in absolute dollars, the year-end tally could top 3.5 trillion dollars based on Thompson financial uh, fit. Uh, so I suppose the M&A uh, uh, activity will uh, be rising and accelerating. I suppose Korea will be no exception to that. So uh, uh, I just hope that uh, the, our policymakers and the legislators uh, look into this uh, in uh, the Gruner's uh, book carefully. Uh, what are the best options for us? And I hope uh, the, uh, they make the uh, want to invite uh, Tim Bruner uh, to personally consult uh, with him. And uh, uh, since Dr. Dr. Bruner is on his way to China, uh, I wish you a good uh, trip and uh, I wish you the best success in your latest book. Thank you very much. <laughs>